लैंग्वेजेस डोंट नो बॉर्डर्स लगीरे लकीरें भाषाओं को नहीं रोक सकती ना ही उनके टुकड़े कर सकती हैं भाषांतर देशांतर के इस रिश्ते को लेकर समन्वय के चौथे संस्करण की नींव रखी गई थी इसी विषय को आपके समक्ष उभारने के लिए जिन लेखकों को मैं आमंत्रित करना चाहूँगी उनके बारे में जितना कहा जाए कम है सबसे पहले स्वागत कीजिए फखरुल आलम जी का ही इज़ एन एकेडमिक अ लिटरी क्रिटिक एंड एसेस्ट एंड एडिटर एज वेल एज अ ट्रांसलेटर फ्रॉम बंगाली 2012 में सार्क लिटरेचर पुरस्कार और 2013 में बांग्ला अकादमी पुरस्कार से उन्हें सम्मानित किया जा चुका है प्लीज जॉइन मी इन वेलकमिंग हिम के सचिदानंदन जी सुप्रसिद्ध कवि हैं और समन्वय की ज्यूरी के सचिव भी हैं मलयालम में उनकी कविताएं दुनिया भर में पढ़ी जाती हैं ही इज एन एक्टिविस्ट फॉर सेक्युलरिज्म इन्वायरमेंट एंड ह्यूमन राइट्स एट प्रेजेंट ही इज डायरेक्टर एंड प्रोफेसर स्कूल ऑफ ट्रांसलेशन स्टडीज एंड ट्रेनिंग इंदिरा गांधी नेशनल ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी डेली He is also on the project advisory board of Indian Literature Abroad, a Government of India initiative. Please join me in giving him a very, very warm welcome. Arundhati Subramanyam, widely translated and anthologized, her new book is the winter choice of the Poetry Book Society UK, shortlisted for the T. S. Eliot Poetry Prize. She has worked over the years as curator, arts journalist, and poetry editor, and has been the head of Indian dance. and head of choraha an interactive arts forum at the national center for the performing arts mumbai for several years please join me in giving her a very warm welcome julian wright ne raag darbari aur aadha gaon ka anuvad hindi urdu se angrezi mein kiya hai no full stops in india aur india in slow motion jaisi kitabon par bhi kaam kar chuki hain anuvadak patrakar aur radio producer bharat mein unki kuch bhumikaye rahi hain please join me in extending her a very warm welcome very arunava sinha kai bengali upanyaso ka anuvad angrezi mein kar chuke hain twice the winner of the crossword translation award he had also been shortlisted for the independent foreign fiction prize he will be the moderator for this session please join me in extending him a very warm welcome as well good afternoon hello good afternoon everyone mm-hmm. shall we just yes i think most of the audience is this way so i'm going to find it easier to go and stand there the i thought i would set a, a short contextual business related backdrop to our conversation today as we know uh, indian literature so many different languages so many writers so many wonderful books in the year 2014 so few readers in the over the past 10 or 12 years um an old tradition of indian literature has been revived there was a time when indian literature used to be translated from one language into another with great enthusiasm energy and speed uh, sachida here would uh, be able to tell us about how works in one language were almost immediately picked up and translated in the others especially in the southern languages where so much of literature from elsewhere in the country was published over the past 10 or 12 years we've seen this stream mostly dry up and most of it moved towards translating into english and english has become almost the de facto language of translated literature from india and indeed the subcontinent bangladesh and pakistan as well respectively works in bangla and urdu but the sober truth today is that um, most of these translated book books translated into english sell approximately 3000 copies over a lifetime if they are lucky so in this context my first question to you would be and i hoping for a short answer from each of you are we overplaying our dependence on english as the target language for translating indian literature should we be looking at actually going back to translating more into the other indian languages and hopefully reaching out to a larger number of readers through those through that process i'll start with you uh, jillian uh i think we should do both i think we should i don't think you need to have either or i think you keep on with english and you put a big emphasis into other language and you look at la- indian languages and you look at different ways of doing it 
because there's a lot of people, as was pointed out in the previous session, people are not going to buy books for one reason or the other. So you've got to look at other ways of reaching them. I mean, you can, you've got all sorts of other media options. So I think um, that it requires a lot of imagination, and, uh, but, but actually you're right, you, it's, English is not enough. Give us some specific ideas since you're talking about other ways besides uh, the old-fashioned way. I think we heard in the previous session, we heard about a lady who writes directly on Facebook. I think you've got to look for things which are shorter and say, for example, put over stories, ideas, publicity, teasers and everything more in that, in that, at that level for people who have the new technology for the younger people. And uh, also, as so many times, you go now to places where there are electricity and there people have televisions. You go, but there's no books in these houses, no books of literature. The kids have their books from school, but then the kids' parents or the kids outside school don't think of reading a book. So take these good stories, take stories, say, from the Northeast and uh, put them onto television if you can, and in such a way that then they also become as popular as, say, Zindigi or something mm -hmm. like that. So you're saying it doesn't just have to be the written word? I think you have to look at everything. You have to look at where, how, where society is going, how people are spending their time, what are they, what, how are they accessing information. And you have to be flexible. I think flexibility is very key in the, in the world in which we live now. Well, all right, thank you. I'll move on to Arundhati. Arundhati, build on that. Or disagree, as you please. Does this work? Yeah. Is this working? Supposed to work. Yes? No, says Jerry. Loudly. Is this the way to do it? Yeah. Okay. It's perhaps the way to do it. Um, I think I'd agree with her, actually, that it needs to be English as well as uh, other options. It, doesn't, it shouldn't be either or. And uh, I was at a discussion recently where I heard Ashok Vajpayee say that, in fact, there is a fair amount of dialogue happening between different languages within the country, more than perhaps one is aware of. That apart, I myself have been involved with a particular project called the Poetry International Web. I've been editor of something called the India Domain of the Poetry International Web. And that's essentially an attempt to make poetry, quality translation of Indian poetry of some stature and caliber, available to an international readership on the net. Personally, I was a kind of apprehensive when I took it on some years ago. I took it on in 2003. I was apprehensive because I myself belong to a generation that needs to read poetry on the page, on the printed page. I'm not comfortable with poetry on the net. And that apart, there were all these questions about how to do um, justice to a very varied poetry scene in this country. That part of it, the second argument I was able to settle for myself when I decided that I would look at this not as a web anthology, but as a web journal. So an attempt to look at the scene, but not in any kind of um, comprehensive or definitive way, but in some way an attempt to reflect the plurality of the scene. That's what the website is about. And the first concern, which was about reading poetry on the web, is something that I resolved for myself when I discovered that my own entry point into contemporary poetry in, say, Israel, or Zimbabwe, or Croatia, was actually happening through the Poetry International Web. There was really no other way I could be aware of what was going on. So I started dipping into it and discovering that there were rewards for me, it's not a substitute for the printed page, but it's an entry point. And I presume it can be that for others as well. Thank you. So we've already got into very interesting territory where the transnation now lives both in and outside the printed page. Sachida, will you take it on from there? Yeah, uh, yeah I think um, the, the kind of generalization you made in the beginning, I don't know, it's not, uh, I don't completely agree with that. Because the scene differs from language to language. I come from, I write in Malayalam basically, even though I do translations into Malayalam and also from Malayalam. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a receiving language. I mean, there are, 
there uh, has been a whole a long tradition of translations into malayalam which is very much alive even today um, because we have we have major publishers like dc books and all that who keep publishing perhaps more translations mm. than original works also because of the dearth of maybe a good uh, good contemporary works so, uh, uh, so and, and this i think is also true of uh, certain other languages uh, like hindi for example is a language uh, that keeps translating from uh, other languages and, and i'm sure there are other languages in the country uh, where uh, tra uh, translation from one language into another uh, is very much alive uh, but uh, if it has come down to some extent or, or if, if there is a threat that it might come down the major reason is going to be uh, this that we are becoming more and more uh, if, if not even bilingual but monolingual um, uh, because the, we always had people who had competence in several languages in the past you know somebody uh, I, 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 I could not think of any translator in Kerala uh, in the in the generation previous to mine uh, who did not know at least three or four languages they, they would inevitably know Tamil and quite a few of them knew Hindi uh, so, that, so that through Hindi they could translate uh, from other languages and, there were, and we had wonderful translators directly from uh, Bengali into Malayalam. But uh, with, the, uh, with the kind of education that uh, we have uh, wrongly perhaps uh, promoted, it seems that this kind of linguistic competency is on the wane. And uh, we, we have people, uh, hardly a, a few people who are competent, competent in to translate, uh, I mean who are bilingual. And uh, quite a lot of people in the new generation are monolingual in a literary sense. You know, they may understand, they may be able to communicate, you know, uh, I mean, they make a daily conversation with their parents and all that. But when it comes to literature, they are practically monolingual. And that's why perhaps uh, there is a kind of dominance of uh, English in the translation scene as a, as a, as a target language. Uh, which, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't think it is a sin uh, because um, uh, if, if times are changing and if, the, if there are more people getting educated uh, in English, uh, there is a necessity there. There is a, there is a clear near literary aesthetic need and there is also a commercial need for uh, books uh, translated into English. Uh, so, uh, uh, at the same time, I think, uh, uh, I for example would be happy to read another Indian writer in Malayalam uh, than in English. Uh, I mean, if I, I, I keep reading in English too because there is no choice. Uh, these, those books are not available in my language. But if it is available, because we, I, 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 and in fact, many of my generation grew up like that. You know, reading, re, uh, reading Tagore, reading uh, Tara Shankar, reading Yashpal, all, all kinds of writers, mainly Hindi, Bengali, Kannada, and Tamil writers, because that is what Indian literature meant to us uh, as, as, uh, as children. Uh, so, so we, we kept reading them in our own lang in our own language, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, that's because then it, it it somehow became part of you when you when you read these things in the language uh, in which you grew up and uh, and in which you later also began to write. And so I would I would always prefer a, a translation from one Indian language into another to a translation from an Indian language into English. Even though I I am compelled by reasons well known that well uh, uh, to, to read a lot of translations uh, uh, into English so uh, what uh, I agree with what they say that I think uh, there is no opposition between these two uh, we, we need to try to keep both these traditions alive because Indian ethos Indian culture the various uh, verbal associations in the text uh, all these are better translated from one Indian language into another Indian language and there are very very specific problems when you try to translate uh, an Indian text into uh, into English, even though there may there may come a time because texts are also getting standardized, mm -hmm. and there may come a time when it is very easy uh, to translate uh, a language text into English. But thankfully, so far uh, it has not happened. In the sense, you know, there are specificities, identities, memories, associations uh, that a particular language evokes, which uh, uh, often get sidelined or or in some sense compromised. Uh, in English translation. So, uh, but still, uh, I would, I would, I would definitely say we should keep both these alive, especially our young uh, generation, in order to reconnect even with their mother tongues. Uh, they need uh, uh, translations in English. At the same time, I would also say that uh, translations uh, among the uh, between the Indian languages, uh, they have also enriched the uh, la uh, the Indian languages, empowered them more than translations into English. Thank you, for Krul sir. I'll reframe the question slightly for you. Um, for you, yours is a, is a slightly different situation. Yes. Bangla is, is the de facto language in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And um, for you, translations of Bangla would mean an international readership. Mm -hmm. 
essentially. So, um, how important is it in, in your scheme of things for Bangla literature to be translated for an international audience? And is the objective different from when it is being read at home? Uh, well, first of all, let me begin by just agreeing with everyone else that it's not an either or thing. Uh, but as you pointed out, my country is a monolingual country. And uh, for unlike in India, I think for 20 years or so, English was more or less phased out. So uh, the, all the translation activity was from English into Bengali for a long time. And there were no quality translations at all. Uh, it's only recently, I think, that we have this uh, market which is growing for uh, Bengali translations into English. And that is happening perhaps partly because of the diaspora, partly because of the diasporic population, and partly because of some authors like Rabindranath and Nozrul being in demand all the time. So uh, the, the, the impetus for tra translation seems to be coming from outside, because uh, diasporic Bangladeshis uh, go to book fairs held in New York or London or somewhere and buy books. And they want to keep up, and they want the children to keep up, so they buy books. And I think the, uh, uh, and when they come back to, uh, to Bangladesh, to, uh, many of them come back in February during the book fair, and they try to pick up as many mm. books as they can at that time. Uh, and for the other thing, for Bengali, uh, uh, trans, uh, from English translations into Bengali, uh, I think that perhaps it's not as active as it was before, before the Bangla Academy used to fund it, and so we had a lot of translations. Now things get translated, but not as much, except that I think in now what happens is if a book is, gets a Nobel Prize or is, mm. becomes controversial for some reason or the other, that's translated almost immediately. And we can even see that people in uh, major intersections buying those books. So there's mm. Mm. an impetus for translation there, uh, uh, you know. Into Bangla. Into Bangla. Understand. All right. I'll just moving on. And Sachita, you're the best person since you've been associated with ILA. Is the program still alive, by the way? Uh, Indian Literature Abroad is a plan to translate uh, the best of Indian literature from the Indian languages into the world's languages and take it out to uh, global audiences. The idea is alive, but I, 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 I will not say that uh, it has really taken off. Uh, there may be institutional reasons, uh, well, well, because I am not in charge of uh, the program anyway. I just happened to be, uh, because uh, it was Ashokji who in fact originally conceived this idea. I remember, uh, you know, uh, when... Um, Vajpayee was the Prime Minister, he even made a declaration that he will hmm. initiate, uh, you know, a kind of institution to, uh, 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 to translate Indian literature into other languages. That is how it started. And then uh, Sahitya Academy has taken it over. We have had one or two meetings. Some books have been identified. Well, uh, uh, three books, as, as, as far as I understand, have been, I mean, they have been given subsidies so that they might appear in, uh, uh, one in French and one in German, one probably in Spanish. Uh, but I don't think it's enough. So the reason I, I'm, what I'm leading up to is my question of whether translations for a global audience need to be different from translations for an Indian audience, even if, say, they're both in English, both in terms of what books to translate and the form, the language, and so on. Do you think that we need to look at separate versions? No, that's, um, I, that's going to be very, very difficult to begin with uh, because, you know, you cannot have two different translations of the same text, uh, I mean, one for the Indian audience and one for the global audience. I, I would say, uh, I, in fact, if you look at the translations of uh, Indian works into English, who are the readers really? They are Indi Indian readers, mostly. mostly. Very few, because I was, because we have a great writer, Ovi Vijayan, whom you also knew. Uh, see, so once when uh, there was a translation seminar organized by the British Council, and I asked the person, have you heard of uh, someone called Ovi Vijayan, whose books, uh, or most of his books are, are available in English. He said, no, some of our libraries where there are, you know, common with literatures as a subject of study, they may have uh, copies, but uh, it has not reached the common reader of England. So, in fact, the translations in India, even in New English, are being done for uh, the Indians who do not know the original language. So, I th and I think uh, it's only proper that the translator also should have essentially an Indian readership in mind, which is realistic, <laughs> even if, I mean, even if uh, you want to reach out to the, a global audience, in fact, they are not uh, very much, uh, maybe, there, maybe there are exceptions, very, very few exceptions, but mostly the readers are Indian, uh, Indian readers, and hence I think it's better to have the Indian reader, and also, 
uh, I mean, uh, take some things for granted so that you can take some things for granted. Exactly. They know certain things, certain references to yes. you know, rituals and cult uh, you know, cultural affairs, festivals, uh, various kinds of things. Uh, so I think it is, uh, it is enough for the time being to have an Indian audience in mind. <laughs> All right. Jillian, let me ask you, what about choice of text? Do you think that some books specifically would make for uh, bigger global readers than Indian readers or vice versa? Um, no, I don't. I think that uh, what happens with English books written in English that do well abroad is they're written with the sensibilities of the English reader, English language reader abroad in in mind. Mm. So, and there is no barrier of language. I mean, you have to do a lot of PR, but I think you have to look at the the industry when it comes down to it. It's not so much a choice of text, it's the resistance mm -hmm. because of the deep insecurities in the publishing industry abroad. And the, uh, the real reluctance to take risks and, uh, and put money. And if you've really got to sell things, one of the reasons why the figure 3000 is there for translations is basically these books are procured for, a, they don't cost much to publish you're getting your money back and then you stop. You're not selling them, okay? So it's not necessary that they don't have the ability if they were pushed, if it was more expensive to do them and you, were, you put more of your money in, the, in, the, in them to begin with, you'd push them more. So I think that um, the choice of text, I think in a way when you're looking for a global market, though I'm not a business person, you've got to take that word translation out. It's got to be a... a it, it's the book, it's the author, it's the selling. It's not, it, it, in a way, translation makes it sound worthy. Mm. Mm. Even in India, it makes it sound a worthy a activity, yes. which puts a lot of people off to start with. Yes. It should be sold for the, what it is. And then, uh, oh, it's a translation. That's ideally how it should be. I, I couldn't agree more, actually. Yes, absolutely. And, um, but you know, speaking personally, it, it's a little funny that um, translations languish at the same level as many fairly mediocre Middle East books written originally in English. When you know that the original texts of the books being translated are far superior, both in literary and even in you know, acceptability terms. But as you said, you sell your quota and that's it. Nobody tries to take it further. That can be a problem. What, what, is your, uh, what is your feedback been, uh, Arundhati? What has your response been to readers of poetry? There are probably very many more uh, excellent English language poets in India than there are English language novelists in India. Okay, I'm just going out on a limb to say that. <laughs> Every language you have that. But I'm going out on a limb to say that. Yes. Um, maybe we should actually just choose to agree with you on that one. <laughs> But uh, that apart, I think the challenge is, I don't know, as far as translation go, to find good English translators of poetry written in various languages in this country has been an uphill task. You know, to locate uh, quality translations is an uphill task. I'm not even saying we've always been successful on the web, on the Poetry International. Because the challenges of translating poetry, I think we'd all agree, are quite singular. It's not just about, there is also specific uh, demands of form. Mm. So in order to understand those challenges, it's not sufficient just to be uh, conversant with a uh, source and target language. You require a certain understanding of poetic form as well. So I think the challenges are tremendous. Yes, I'm sure there are... Uh, I'm sure there are ways in which, and this is something I've encountered in subtle ways, perhaps, where you encounter um, a certain strand of uh, a Western cultural establishment that mm -hmm. seems to want portraits of uh, exotic India, impoverished India. That's there. Hmm. One, Even one in poetry. Even in poetry, absolutely. Or else a poem that is significant for extra literary reasons. Maybe it was a poem that was banned mm. or created a furor for mm. various uh, sociological reasons mm. or contextual reasons. So if you offer that information, the poem will be read differently, received differently, and it's not always a bad thing. Mm. But um, the trick, I mean, the the tricky part, the dodgy part is, of course, whether you're actually choosing to 
translate keeping that in mind and making that the point of saleability. Hopefully, those are things that translators, publishers, those who market literature have to uh, ask themselves inconvenient questions about, you know, not take the easy way out as far as that goes. A very, um, an example, for instance, and I was discussing this just the other day, was Kuti Revati's poem. She's here, I think. Is she? Yes. Revati, I remember your, your book, Breasts, and which uh, C.S. Lakshmi first discussed in her Sparrow conference, which is how I came across it. And I know what a huge um, furore that created at the time of its publication, the kind of controversy, the kind of witch hunt that happened with the whole, that a whole, uh, that several other Tamil women poets have subsequently faced. Now, if we were to look at that in the context of another literary subculture, maybe even in English in this country, the same, a poem by the same name would not raise an eyebrow. Or maybe it would just provoke some kind of lewd remark and that's about it. Well, that was then. Today it might be slightly different. It could be Fifty Shades of Grey, but you know, even so. What I'm trying to say is we are aware all the time that we're negotiating mm. differences of these kinds. And yet, finally, if those poems work for me, it's also because one senses that there is a real negotiation with language happening. So it's not simply because um, this seems to be pushing certain buttons which makes it um, exciting for us or salacious for us. It's also because it seems to be a poem, a real poem. So I think these are questions that editors also have to constantly ask themselves and deal with. Hmm. Okay, moving on. For can I, Shab, let can, me, can oh, sorry, I just yes, make a, yes, yes. Um, a short point there? is that also Indian poetry, Indian language poetry, is very often, you're talking about the importance of the page, is performance poetry. The actual written, written version is just there basically as a guide for the performance. And I'm, uh, and I'm thinking in particular of, uh, because it's, it's just been Mohoram, of the poetry of Mir Anis, the 19th century poetry of Mir Anis, which is written in Urdu which when performed as one-man theatre, which is what it's basically intended to be, is eminently understandable even by people who don't know Urdu and for whom many of the words are unfamiliar. Um, so that is also, isn't that a major obstacle? In yes, but I mean, performance poetry is one whole area unto itself. Yeah. But there is a lot of Indian poetry in various Indian languages being written for the mm. page. Mm. A lot of it, you know, a huge volume of it as well. Yeah. And that has its own share of challenges when you're translating, certainly. Thank you. So, uh, Fakul Sahib, I want to ask you, Bangladesh has obviously a very rich and varied, um, the width of literature is quite, quite large. And in fact, you know, ba Bangla literature in Bangladesh works very strongly in science fiction, for example, which is, which is not perhaps very well known outside mm -hmm. in other countries. The children's literature canon is very strong as well. Um, so do you, how do you pick what to translate when you're looking at your global translation strategy? Well, just based on my own experience, uh, there are any number of reasons a book will be translated into English. Uh, for example, one book which I worked on uh, was Jivan Nadash and I, uh, just was overwhelmed by his poetry and I decided to do work on it and I translated it without thinking of publisher. One of the questions you asked earlier was about uh, how do you target it for readers from a very different culture. So, you know, I, I, I decided to use some a glossary, I decided to use some notes, but I had no idea whether the book would sell or not, so I just went ahead and published and it's, and it's done reasonably well over the years. The, another book that I did was the Unfinished Memoirs of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and there was a demand for it. You know, the, the book was being sponsored by the, uh, at that time, the leader of the opposition. She uh, initiated the project, and then um, later on, Penguin India and OUP Pakistan took an interest, and so the book was published there. At the moment, I'm working on a 19th century, uh, late 19th century Bengali classic uh, and called Bishat Shindu, mm -hmm. and that is for the Sark Cultural Center, mm -hmm. and they have this project for uh, publishing uh, classics from the Sark region which have not been published before. So it seems to me that uh, the market sometimes decides. For example, Bengali books, uh, you talked about uh, science fiction, Bengali books, uh, poetry, uh, mystic poetry, you know, seems to, Lalon, for example, seems to have a lot of I interest for outsiders. So that kind of words gets published. Others don't. 
you know. So it depends. I think that it's very difficult to categorize why certain books get published and others mm. don't. Mm. Uh, some are market driven, some aren't. Some are sponsored by the state, some uh, just are uh, driven by the passion of the translator. Uh, you know, so the, it seems to be all kinds of things happening there. I, I, I've also noticed now that diasporic uh, Bangladeshis want to translate things that they like into English right. and put it on the net. Mm. That happens quite a bit. Yes. So I would say there are any number of reasons uh, that's it's making It's gathering pace public. now. Yeah. Yes. Lalun, Lalun Pokit, by the way, is um, a little bit like Rumi. Sorry for, the <laughs> for this, but just as Rumi is America's largest selling poet, so is Lalon uh, mm -hmm. the largest selling poet among, outside of Tagore, I think, among Bangla reading, uh, Bangla poetry buying people. All right, so, um, so I, I'm trying to lead up to a slightly larger question and maybe this is, this is less of practical utility, but it's, it's a thought that I grapple with sometimes, which is that given, that given the fact that India and if you add the subcontinent, so many languages, and while there are interlinkages, between the languages and the culture, they're also very unique and distinct in their own way. A little bit like Europe, perhaps. Would you say it's a fair comparison uh, from a literary point of view, Europe and India? Um, so is it important to have something called Indian literature, since we call it Indian literature abroad? I know it's a geographic and political entity, but can it be a cultural entity? And therefore, does it then need that, you know, one stream of translation into English typically and other languages? Or should we now start thinking of our literatures as multiple literatures and present them the same way to one another and to the world as well? Ah. Yes. Well, many years ago, I was in a conference uh, and, uh, in, 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 in England. And uh, what surprised me was that most of the people in the conference were translators who had paid money to come to the conference. And uh, what they told me surprised me even more because they said that in Europe, especially in the, in, in the, uh, the parts which, uh, you know, the, the parts of Europe which changed after the Cold War ended, uh, there was so much translation activity going on and there was such demand for books from English, from French, from German, from one language to another. So, you know, there was, there was such buzz, it seemed to me, from the, just listening to them. And I would think that this would be happening in our part of the world mm. and, it, and it hasn't really had that effect, even though uh, from what I gather, in English is the dominant language now in Europe too. So uh, maybe the readership just didn't catch on like it should have, uh, but perhaps it will, who knows. Who knows? Yes, of course, I mean, I think what Jillian and Sajida are both arguing is that uh, there is a lot of interlanguage translation activity, maybe not as visible to others. We tend to often have a very Delhi-centric point of view, and the English language publishers are here, so we think that is the beginning and end of the world, which it's not. But coming back to that point, would you, would you, what do you think? Yeah, I think even, uh, even comparing Indian literature with the European literature would be a simplification. Look, I mean, um, given the kind of uh, extreme linguistic complexity of the, I mean, I mean and, and the whole, uh, looking at the literary cartography, mm -hmm. I, mean, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, even that will be a simplification because That's we have right. so, many, mm -hmm. so many languages, mother tongues, and we have uh, so many oral traditions, tri uh, tribal languages, and the so-called dialects, which could uh, anyway yes. uh, graduate into right. proper languages, as they say, if they have a political party and an army and uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's 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 much more complex than in uh, than in europe uh, because even the division between a dialect and a language is not uh, that clear as perhaps uh, we, uh, it is uh, in europe with us mm. uh, so and and this question of um, in the literature i mean is it singular plural i think we have been asking this question over and over again and and it has become uh, a little stale at least for me it has become a little stale i have written a lot on that uh, from different kinds of uh, points of view. Um, uh, so I think um, that kind of a discussion will not lead us anywhere ultimately. Even if, so you can say it is there, you can, you can say it is not there. I remember um, late uh, Anantamurti, whom I remember so fondly again and again, every time I think about all these things, uh, used to say that if you look for the unity of Indian literature, you will find the diversity. And if you look for the diversity of Indian literature, you will find the unity. And there was a truth, a lot of truth in that, because there have been arguments uh, that that there is no Indian literature and also an argument that there is a single united company uh, called Indian literature. Well, that doesn't exist anyway uh, because languages have their identities, have their own cultural pasts and presence and so we need to actually kind of negotiate, uh, you know, um, between the, these two, uh, the, the so-called unity and the so-called diversity. And so we should look at Indian literature as a, as a mosaic of many literatures. We should accept 
respect uh, its uh, plurality and the difference between one language and the other. And we can, if we want, also find out, you know, what is common to them. Because, uh, but, but I personally think that it was, that quest was very important during the freedom struggle and all that, you know, just to unite people. And uh, the idea of a national literature was born with the nation, when, when mm, the, mm. with the idea of independence and all that. And that has happened everywhere, actually, an idea of a, we need uh, a kind of national literature. So, uh, but perhaps that idea is not uh, no more uh, very useful now. I, I, don't, I think somehow we have survived uh, all, these, uh, all these years. Uh, we have st uh, stood together despite all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, factions and uh, um, at attempts at uh, dividing the country and all that. So, uh, so, so we need to look at, I think now we should uh, ne uh, need more to look at the, uh, the identities of different literatures and also try to address them even when we, when we translate them. So I, I would, I that's would what I'm use a plural at. term, Indian that, That's what I'm getting at. Because, yeah. I mean, especially in the context of translation, both for Indian uh, markets, I def deliberately use the word markets, and global markets, it's very easy to homogenize and, you know, Indian literature. And then which immediately starts putting it one in three or four boxes, as you said. But maybe um, not so much an academic question, but we are perhaps doing a disservice to not talk of uh, Malayali literature or Tamil literature in as many words or Bengali literature and try to create unique identities for them. So I don't know what you think, whether um, translation has a role to play in this, whether translation should f emphasize the regional um, identity in some ways, I don't know how. Uh, I think that when, uh, when books have uh, a strong regional identity, you know, they're strongly linked to a particular place and a particular time or a particular community, that naturally comes out in the translation mm. itself. Mm. And other books which are, say, settled in a more, uh, <laughs> more sort of urban, modern uh, setting are sort of more pan-Indian in the way that they read. Um, but I think that we do talk about Bengali literature. I don't think I've ever, <laughs> over the last 30 years, not heard people talking about it, or Tamil unit, uh, literature, mm. or Malayalam literature. So I think that that has been something which, which has been talked about a lot. And um, the important thing, I think, is where, where we began. I, when, I, when I left school, when I was 17 and I went to work, I went to work in the BBC in London, where at that stage it was a very big building and there were two sort of classical chaps standing on the roof and underneath was written, nation shall speak nation, peace unto nation. And I really do think the important thing is that people from different language groups and different regions and everything should have access and, and speak to each other through the medium of literary translation. And wherever possible, this should be done in, uh, in the widest possible forms, as I indicated at the beginning. For example, when you're pre preparing think books for neo-literates, you should do things also which come from different parts of India, which will be interesting for them, but will also open their minds, minds in that way. So I think the, the, but the important thing is we, we do allow uh, more and more, as much as being done, there's scope for a hell of a lot more. Can I add yes, please, of course. Uh, uh, because Jirian uh, translates primarily from Hindi, um, and uh, so so I think it goes beyond the language uh, 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 to the level of the text itself. Satinath Badri, for example, or Paneshwar Nath Renu in Hindi, yeah. you know, they are more challenging, and their texts resist uh, uh, translation much more than, say, a modern author like uh, Nirmal Verma, for example. Okay. I'm what not saying that, that yeah. we that publishers, that people at large can do to make, bring more of translated literature out into the hands of readers. Ideas, suggestions, revolutionary thoughts. <laughs> I'll start with you, Fakul Sahib, while well, they think. Well, uh, I've found recently that the internet is a very good way of circulating translations, work in translation, work in progress, uh, and that seems to attract a lot of people. And uh, you are surprised that uh, some months after you've uh, published something in some journal, uh, you know, somebody has read it because it's an electronic journal and it comes back to you and then other people come back to you. So I think that one of the things that we can do is we can become uh, more active on the net. Not only I'm, by putting stuff on the net in Facebook as was mentioned earlier on, but by also publishing in interactive journals. 
in, in, in uh, the journals, uh, electronic journals. I think that seems to help a lot. I mean, much more than print. Print seems to be much more limited now in, in this day and age. And seems to be working, uh, you know, very much with at least some of the things that I'm doing. That people seem to know much more because of the net. Because of the net. Sachida, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I personally feel there is um, greater interest in translation than before when it comes to publishers. You know, there was a time when, um, except the J.C.O. company or somebody, very few publishers published translation. But, but uh, for, for specific reasons, probably because they are not getting enough Indian, good Indian English writing, that could well be one reason. Uh, like uh, the OUP or um, you know Orion Black Swan or Macmillan, uh, they, they all of them have also a translation contingent, a, trans a kind of translation program, uh, which is uh, something very positive, uh, which perhaps needs to be empowered and strengthened. And as you suggested, uh, uh, the translation journals, uh, online translations and translation websites, they can they can definitely do uh, a lot in uh, you know, making translations more popular and. Uh, uh, and also re uh, reaching out to uh, the, the new generation, which uh, mostly are uh, uh, technology yeah. savvy. Technology. Uh, so uh, I can't think of many other ideas except that. But well, I have been translating all my, I mean, yes, like from do. my school days actually. And uh, uh, and so and uh, so for me, of course, the books have been the best uh, kind of uh, sites where I could put these translations together. And uh, well. I have some 1,500 pages of translations of poetry from all over the world, which now have come out in four volumes, and and they are they are being uh, let me say they 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 have, they have found their readers. They have. I mean, in most cases, the first edition is over, and they're entering the second edition, and all that. Uh, but it may not be the case with all the languages. But yes, definitely in languages like Bengali and Malayalam and Marathi, and um, I, I'm sure that there is a kind of very different poetic culture. Mm. And, and yes, there are fiction uh, translations too, and translations are uh, very popular. I, I remember once I quoted it, I think, N.S. Madhavan, one of our writers, was asked this question, who is the most popular Malayalam writer? <laughs> and he, an he answered, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, one of our writers was asked, um, who is the most popular Malayalam writer? And he said, he said Gabriel Garcia Marquez. <laughs> because every, every one of his works is available. In fact, one was published in Malayalam along with the Spanish original and not with the English translation, before the English translation came out. So, and when he died, every journal came out with a special issue. Every, every literary journal, little magazines and big magazines came out with a special issue on markets. So, so to, to, to develop that kind of a translation culture, I think is ultimately very important through journals, through books, through on, uh, online, all, all kinds of uh, media. I, I, I don't find an easy way to do that, but, but I think we need to do that. You've also done something interesting. You've taken a lot of your works out of copyright and you've put them up for free dissemination and reproduction. Yeah, uh, yes, because, I, I, because ultimately I believe in the commons. Uh, basically, that is my political philosophy. And so, uh, and so I have put my uh, selected poems, which is about 400 pages. Uh, uh, I mean, it's free. Anybody can download those poems in the original. I also put one of my plays uh, on Gandhi uh, on the web. And my, my plan is gradually to uh, free all my books from uh, copyright, at least to... to uh, not, not to become a great example, but at least to, uh, to do what uh, you preach. <laughs> no, I think that's fantastic, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, so, Jilin, can I ask you to expand a little bit on a point you made, which is not to place translation, there's translations. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think you've, he's just made that point yes. with Marquez. <laughs> yes, of being course. Being the greatest Malayalam <laughs> author. I mean, it shouldn't appear like that. This, so this, this is how they should be marketed. And this is how they should be read. So why do you think that's not happening? Why do you think publishers are focusing so much on that word? Is it, is it quite frankly, the translators demand that their name appear on the, on the cover and so on? <laughs> because it's a big bone of contention. I tell you, translators are generally pretty self-effacing people in my experience. And I don't know anyone who's, perhaps there are a few who's demanded to have their names put on the covers. Well, uh, I've had plenty of arguments with people who think their name should be on the cover. And I've just made the point that agreed, but you know, if it helps uh, to sell more books by not drawing attention to the fact that it's a translation, because as you said, I, I think unless the the um, and the the translator themselves is a draw, then uh, yes, you that's can. Different, of course. Uh, but it, the the aim is basically in the end, it is the, the author's book. It's not the translator's book, um, and so it should be sold on that basis. I think. See, when Jayco used to publish. 
Uh, when Jayco used to publish translations, they never said they were translations. There were no names of translators. And we read them as if they were written in English by Sharad Chandra, Chatterjee and Prem Chand and all those people. Well, at least we have come a, lo we have come a long way from that kind of uh, anonymity, uh, even though something of that still sticks, actually. Yeah. Uh, even now, well, I don't think the translator has really got uh, his or her due. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I personally believe that their names should be there on, on the cover, etc. Uh, not, I mean, just symbolically to show that this is a very important cultural activity. What do you think, Arundhati? What are the missing pieces? Uh, just to go back to your earlier point, I certainly have found, for instance, uh, particularly at the time when our domain was uh, quarterly and regular, we had, there was quite a maelstrom of responses from editors, festival organizers all over the world readers as well, mm. asking to be connected to various poets and to asking to be connected to translators. So this, to my mind, was something to feel good about. We pay a pittance because our funding has been meager, but we make sure our translators get paid a little more than our poets do. So we certainly, these are small attempts at uh, valuing the act of translation. But I actually wanted to reflect on something that Gillian had said earlier when she talked about translation being looked at as worthy activity. Mm. You know, of course it is worthy. But the fact is that somewhere I think that also reflects a deeper bias of a cultural environment that we live in, where sometimes it feels like there are just two choices. We are being polarized in a way where there are two choices available to us either to be terminally earnest or to be completely escapist. You know, so either right, it's right. literature that's sanctimonious sociology or it is literature that's soundbite. Mm. Now, if you are in that kind of environment, even your translations are going to reflect the schism, I think. And I think in many ways that's what we have to also look at. Mm. We can't look at translation in separation from this uh, issue to my mind. Yes, of course. My, my personal bone to pick is that we don't teach our literature in our schools. We don't. We, even even uh, what's taught under English literature is, is the same works that were being read 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Well, I think that's, I think that's changing. Is it? I, I do think that's changing and I think it's changing. I've seen in uh, certainly in Delhi University in English literature courses. Yes, changing college, there. yes, but I'm talking more of school where the reading habit is formed. Yeah. Because by the time you've chosen to read a literature course in college, you're already a reader or yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. But uh, my son is 12 years old, mm. and I find that he's not reading a single work uh, of Indian literature, all of many of which are available in excellent translations and eminently suitable for 12 and 13 and 14 year olds. Yeah. But um, we're going to read about plastic surgery in ancient India. But Indian you know, Arunab, I also feel that sometimes we are being told, read this translation because it's good for you. Hmm. Read this translation yeah. because what's being written in your language is terrible. This is the real stuff. When you're told that with yeah. this kind of value judgment attached, Obviously. if anything, it's like eating your greens, you know, being told that it's good for you. That's a dreadful way to approach right. literature, whatever it is, you know. I think we talk perhaps too much about that aspect of it and not enough about the excitement, the pleasurable excitement of uh, negotiating with language. So when you talked about some writers being easier to translate, I know I've made decisions of this kind sometimes. When you're meeting a deadline, you pick up the easier poems to translate, get on with those, because the ones that really are going to tear you apart are those that you defer. And that's unfortunate, because of course you never get around to doing them. Mm. But I suspect that if one actually tried, there may be some of the more artisanal excitement uh, that could be communicated as well, you know, and I think readers of all kinds are also looking for that. We need to talk more about the sensuous aspects of literature too, and translation, I think, can also talk about that. Yes, you know, absolutely. Now, I'm very enthused by the thought that all of you have that translators can go out so much directly to readers using the online medium. After all, you want, you, you're writing, you're translating to be read, and if you can find readers, that's the best thing, right? The commerce aspect is almost secondary. It's not that anyone's making much money anyway by writing books. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. Thank you, and uh, I'm going to open this to the house questions. Okay, and we have one from the front row. Yes. Do you want the mic? Ah. Um, 
It's been the most enlightening session. And uh, while this question may be a little banal for this forum, I still want to sort of um, ask it. Uh, we heard several number of times that the kind of translators that we get from, uh, I mean, for various languages, for them to translate our work into the language we want, aren't up to a certain level or don't have the sensibilities that one should have. What role do we think education, and especially primary education, up to level 10 or 12, play in increasing and creating these sensibilities in us as children? If anybody could answer that. Yes, Patrick. Um, well, you know, I, I, I'm a teacher of English, and uh, in English, ELT has been increasingly dominant, and one of the theories that ELT came up with was communicative teaching, and uh, the idea was not to teach uh, and do any translation in the classroom. And that idea has been reversed lately, and one of the things that can be done is at the primary level to make students learning English or another language do a lot of translating tasks. Mm. Uh, Rabindranath actually, when he taught uh, his school, did a lot of that and there's a book on it and seemed to be a very effective way of teaching. So I would think that doing translation exercises at the primary level in learning another language other than the mother tongue would be very useful. I think all of us, all of us grew up on that, in, uh, at least when I was a student, translation was an inseparable part of yeah. a, a question Same, paper. Yeah. Yeah. Even though uh, I don't really think that, you know, that contributed a lot to developing our translation talent, but at least we knew there was an activity of translation and there was some attempt to grapple with uh, another language uh, and, to, and to have it in your language and all that. Uh, and, and that, uh, well, that, that can help uh, also later when you actually develop translation modules and courses uh, um, at, at the university level. Um, so tra but uh, one, yeah, training translators, I think, is an important, uh, that, is, that we need to address, actually. Uh, uh, because there, there are comp people who are competent in the language, but still are somehow not able to translate. Uh, because of certain other problems, like, you know, cultural issues and all. So there, perhaps, uh, some kind of a training will help. Even though we mostly had instinctive translators uh, until now, maybe we need also uh, translators who, I mean, some kind of a... Uh, training program, which is happening in some universities and all that, which uh, once I also had a department like that. So it's quite it's possible that, uh, well, to some extent, some, uh, at least they will be aware, more aware of the issues involved in translation, uh, and they won't take it as a very, very simple mm. kind of task. Yeah. Also, it's a different form of reading when you're translating, you yeah. read so differently. I was just going to say, it's also a very deep form of listening. And I think uh, that's what perhaps education can do. It can, you know, hone your ability to be a listener of a particular kind. I think uh, what many students I know, and certainly my generation had to deal with, and I think subsequently, is the tyranny of paraphrase. <laughs> yeah, so you were told that if you were able to paraphrase a poem and render it in three uh, cogent paragraphs that you had understood the poem. And the poet, of course, poor thing, had not understood it and was incapable of doing it, so wrote it in uh, this kind of fragmented, incoherent fashion, which you could then decode. And I think the tragedy of that is that we were encouraged to believe that, we, that a poem is just about its content, that a poem is just about meaning. I think to believe that is to produce a particular kind of reader who is only looking to see what he or she can extract from a text. And then the pleasure of it the, uh, the wonder of it, which are all the primary reasons why we are drawn to literature in the first place, all of that is snuffed out. And I think something vital is lost for the reader and then therefore subsequently, potentially, for the translator. Any other? Yes. When Gillian started something which is very interesting, she said that the other kind of translations, that is translating literature into the films and television and various other kinds of ways of reaching out people uh, should also be explored. And I think uh, that's very crucial because in Bangladesh, we have lots of cases where you have the paint, painter and poet together, writing, painting, and books come out, anthologies come out. Tigor himself has done that. And Tigor has done translation of poetry, a painting into poetry in one of his books called Vichitrita. Thirteen different painters, their paintings, he's translated them into poetry. Now, there's been this kind of connection which developed in, in 
uh, translation, which is somehow not highlighted, not discussed at all. But I think uh, one of the ways of uh, looking at translation would also be the intersemiotic manner in which texts reach the other medium, the visual medium, and various other kind of medium. So that's something perhaps any one of you would like to throw a few thoughts on. Or will you just agree? Agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just agree, right? All right, we'll ask her there and then Jerry at the back. Take the mic. I've been a student of English literature at Delhi University and like Jillian was saying, they have introduced a lot of Indian writers into the course, which is great. And of course, we read them in translation, so we read them in English, which I understand because most of us are from different linguistic backgrounds, so it makes sense to read them in one language. But at no point were we, say, encouraged or motivated to read them in the original. And when I went to do my master's, which was in London, I met these students from Norway, from other parts of Europe, who had read Prem Chand in Hindi and I hadn't. And I mean, just that, what is it that we can do to encourage, say, reading the originals as well, along with the translation? Because we just feel like we've read Prem Chand because we've read the translation, but I feel like there's something lacking there. Is this off? Yeah. I think there's definitely, you should be reading it in translation also. And I think um, certainly in the translation studies program that they have, that's the sort of their thing that they're doing it. But they should not be, I think, so exclusivist in the English department. I know at the moment there's problems with certain years because the four-year uh, four course is now a three-year course again, and that puts a lot of extra uh, pressure on students. But I, I do agree that it's very important. And recently I was uh, talking to, there was a class being held in Harvard on a translation that I had done. And they were asking me sort of what was the original word you used for this and that and the other. And I was very impressed by that. And I think it is important to, to look at them both and wherever possible, given your own linguistic backwards, background, to go back to the text. Thank you. Jerry? I just wanted to add something to what she asked about schools. About uh, nine years ago, after five years of the Sarva Shikshan Abhyan, Hiram Kulkarni did a study of how Marathi is taught in rural schools. He found that 80% of the children who had been studying Marathi as the primary language only could write one form of the five possible forms of R. I translated the book that he wrote Shala Ahe Shikshan Nahi into English and it is still with a publisher after eight years who has not bothered to publish it because she is a small independent press who thinks that they are morally superior to large in presses that would have brought the book out. Story one. Story two. When M in the Big Home, my novel, was being translated into Marathi, Shanta Gokhale offered very kindly to translate it. At one point, just because she's my friend, I asked, how much are they paying you? And she said, zero. They're not paying me anything. How long do you expect translation to continue on the back of volunteerism? How long do we expect people to translate and give a substantial portion of their time and energy and intellectual input when they, are want, they want to do other things because we think it is a good deed to do. And after that you are saying, your name should not appear on the covers. Then what is left? Why bother? We'll end up in our ghettos. If it encourages people to translate and even if it encourages bad translation, I say, let them have their names on in lights. And then the good translation will come out because the bad translation may upset someone enough to translate properly and well. But that's the starting point. If you do not respect... I was at a, a reading with a poet, Amir Orr from Israel, who read out his poets in, poetry in English. I said, who translated that? Those, he said, I don't know. I wanted to hit him. How can you not know? This is someone who did you some service rendered your poetry in another language you don't know 
die dog i felt like saying but of course you know uh, international amity and all that sort <laughs> thank you jedi to ensuring that we don't walk out of here feeling as cheerful as we did 5 minutes ago <laughs> If I could just add to that, uh, I mean, uh, in my class 12 CBSE book, I had a Neruda poem. So in that poem, uh, I mean, it was just written by Pablo Neruda, and uh, I mean, and uh, but then I never knew that Neruda actually never wrote in English. And so same was the case with Tagore when I wrote, actually read Tagore in class 11. He was, and I read Tagore in Hindi, and I was I was so happy that you know Tagore wrote in Hindi, and uh, and I went to my dad and told him, Dad, I I read Tagore today and all that. I think it was it was in class nine, and then my dad tells me that Tagore never wrote in Hindi. So even the CBSE books, I mean CBSE is like this 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 the biggest educational I mean forum that our country has. I mean they never mention translations or editors or you know. Uh, introductions that they might take from from any person who's done some kind of translation. Such times, I mean, how where do you where do you see all this going? And think that the question of the translator's name, you know, not being there in the book actually stands. No, at I all. think you're confusing you. two things. Firstly, the name on the cover. The name is on the inside of the book, on the on the front page of the on the inside of the book. The question is whether it's on the outside of the cover or not. So then the translator's name is there. If the translator's name or the original language is not there in the CBS textbooks, still CBSE's textbooks, then that's something that they really should do something about. It should not be like that. I think we'd all agree. I mean, it's not necessarily about one thing or the other, the cover or something yeah. else, as much as it is about valuing the act of translation. And therefore, and therefore the support follows, I think, in one way or the other. But the importance of valuing it, certainly, is something we're looking at. Disagree about that. I Excellent. Except there are many ways of being worthwhile, Jerry, and there are many ways of being affirmed and validated. This is not the only one, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. So it, all of it adds up. Panel discussions. You get that at least. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Yes? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. I just wanted to ask, like, few of those guys said, like, when we were in 9th class or 10th class, they were, like, wondering, like, this. They were not aware, like, uh, this text was from uh, some particular language or not. Uh, I would like to ask them, do you, like, do you really care, like, when you are in... 9th standard or 10th standard or 8th standard, do you really care like from which language does that text belong? The question, the question, the question is not whether you care, the question is whether you should know or not. Do you care really very much about your maths? You probably don't, but you still have to do it, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what 9th standard has to do with it though. As an example. As an example. No, I understand. All right. Thank you. I think our time is up. All translators never get more than their 45 minutes. <laughs>